I'm very pleased to be here, and thank you for that introduction. Tonight, this evening, I'd like to call your attention to attention. And let me begin with a, a story. It's about a classic experiment in social psychology. It was done many years ago at the um, Princeton Theological Seminary with divinity students. Each student was told that they're going to give a practice sermon. They'd receive a topic to prepare, and then they go to another building and give the sermon to be evaluated. Half of the students were given the parable of the Good Samaritan as their topic, the man who stopped to help the stranger in need by the side of the road. The other half were given random Bible topics. As each divinity student went over to the other building to give their sermon, they passed a man who was bent over and moaning in pain. The interesting question is, did they stop to help? The more interesting question is, did it matter if they're pondering the parable of the Good Samaritan? What do you think? Didn't matter. Made no difference at all. What mattered was how much time pressure people felt they were under. And this is more or less the story of our lives. There's a spectrum that runs from noticing the other person to tuning into the other person to empathizing and understanding what's going on with them. And then if they're in need and there's something that we can do, compassion and, and maybe helping them. But if we never notice in the first place, we never go down that road. And this is the problem with attention today. It's under siege. I think the moment I knew we were in trouble was uh, a while back before I started writing the book, Focus. I was uh, on my way to a meeting. I was driving. I live out in the country in New England. I, I was late, but I, I was wanting people there to know I was coming. So as I was driving, I was texting them on my way. <laughs> that, that's rather horrible because it turns out, as I read not uh, very long after that, that texting while driving is the same as drinking while driving. It's really bad. In fact, in my state, it's outlawed now. Another thing I've noticed is when I was writing the book, I'd be uh, kind of on a riff, really in flow, writing well. And then I'd have to look something up. So I'd go to Google Scholar. I love Google Scholar because it gives you access to the academic database. So I open my web browser. And my web browser presents me with the, the news of the day. And I'm a news junkie. So all of a sudden, I start reading news stories. And before I know it, I've been lost. You know, 15, 20 minutes has gone by before I realize that, oh, I was supposed to be looking that up. And today, we're all in the same boat in that the tools that we use, our computer, our phone, and so on, are also devised to interrupt us, to seduce us, to draw our attention from this to that. And usually under that is trying to sell us something, a pop-up ad or whatever. But attention is besieged in a way that has never been true before. When I was going around to publishers and telling them I wanted to write about attention, one publisher said to me, that's wonderful. We'd love to have that book, but could you keep it short? So what happened to us? In, in 2007, Time magazine, a major American publication, had a small article that said there's a new word in the English language. The word is pizzled. It's a combination of puzzled and pissed off. And it refers to the moment when you're with someone who takes out their Blackberry and starts talking to someone else and ignoring you. In 2007, that was unusual. But the word pizzled has died with the Blackberry because now that's the new social norm. You go to, out to a, a dinner, a very romantic restaurant, you see a couple together and they're both looking at their phones instead of into each other's eyes. Something has happened to us. In 1977, a Nobel Prize winner, Herbert Simon, wrote, very prescient, he said, information consumes attention. Hence, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. 
I think we've entered a time when we're in danger of intentional impoverishment. And the, the signs of it are, are more than, you know, a couple watching their, looking at their phone instead of into each other's eyes. You, the other day I saw a, a mom holding a, a little toddler and the toddler's trying to get her attention and she's busy texting. She's just not available. And, you know, of course, dad's the same story. I was on a vacation island last summer, Martha's Vineyard, off the coast of New England, and I was taking a taxi from the ferry to my house, and I happened to share it with seven sorority sisters, college students, who were going for a weekend together. And uh, we got in the, it was a shared taxi, a big van, and we got in the taxi, and within a minute or two, every one of the sorority sisters was staring into a screen iPhone, iPad, but they weren't talking to each other. And I think this is a, a real loss. The ingredients of rapport are three. The first is full mutual attention. From that full attention comes a second ingredient. Uh, it's a nonverbal synchrony. If you look at two people who are really in rapport, really connecting, if you were to make a video of that and watch it in silence, the two bodies look as though they're choreographed. This is something that's managed by a category of brain cell called oscillators. Oscillators govern how we respond to someone else, how we respond to physical objects. Oscillators are very important for the survival of the human species. Consider this. At the moment of a first kiss, they determine the velocity at which two skulls come together. And if they get it wrong, it would be the end of the, <laughs> the species, I'm sure. The third ingredient, uh, after the full attention and the nonverbal synchrony, is that it feels good. It's a, a rather pleasant, joyous state to connect with someone that well. These are the moments in our lives that are the richest, that, that uh, really matter. However, recently there was an article in the Harvard Business Review called The Human Moment. It said, if you want to have real connection with someone, and if they come into your office, remember this, turn away from your screen, ignore your phone and every other device, stop your daydream or whatever's on your mind, and pay full attention to the person in front of you. I find it sad that we have to have an article in the Harvard Business Review to tell us something <laughs> like that. But it has come to this, because uh, attention uh, is a rarer and rarer commodity, but it's a very precious commodity. I think the time has come for us to take an active stand in our lives and fight back against this subtle uh, onslaught. I know a couple, for example, who, when they come home, have a pact that they'll put their phones in a drawer. They won't look at them for the evening. There's a, a new um, way of getting together. I don't know if this has happened here in the UK, but in the States, for example, when people get together for dinner, everybody takes their phone out, puts it in the middle of the table, and the first person that reaches for their phone before the bill comes has to pay the bill. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's not just one kind of attention, uh, attention, there's several varieties. The most obvious is selective attention, when we focus on one thing and ignore others. There are two main kinds of distractors, two general classes. One is sensory distractors. So if you're looking at me, you're probably not noticing this whiteboard here, right? That's relatively easy. The tough one is the second category. It's emotional distractors. Our emotional distractors are extremely powerful. Their thoughts about that conversation that didn't go so well, the tiff I had with my partner this morning, mostly relationship concerns, things that have upset us. So the more focused we are, the better we do at anything. Is it rather obvious, but uh, for example, a test of concentration among athletes predicts how well they'll do the next season. Uh, that's rather straightforward. 
And the less our mind wanders or students mind wander in reading a text, the better we comprehend the text. However, it turns out on average, while we're reading a book, our mind wanders about 20 to 40% of the time. I think it depends on the book. That particular study was done with Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> <laughs> if it had been done, say, with, I don't know, Fifty Shades of Grey or Blink or whatever, it might have been different. But the, the point is that the more disrupted attention is, particularly for young people, the harder it is for them to grasp, to build the cumulative mental models that amount to mastery in, in any subject. There are basically uh, three modes of attention I, I want to call your attention to. And here's a schematic. So this is generally the relationship between Performance, say this is high, this is low, and this is the, um, the horizontal line is brain activity, particularly levels of stress hormones uh, like cortisol, adrenaline. And the relationship is very telling. It goes like this. It's an upside down U. And the highest performance is when attention is absolutely 100%, maybe 110%. It's been called flow. Flow was discovered, for those of you who don't know about it, by researchers who asked people in, in many different domains of expertise, basketball players, ballerinas, neurosurgeons, tell us about a time you outdid yourself. You were absolutely at your best. Even you were surprised. And no matter what the domain was, people were describing the same phenomenological state. And one of the characteristics of the state is that attention is utterly absorbed. There was a neurosurgeon who said, I, I had to do a, a, a surgery, an operation that I didn't really know if I could. It was so difficult. But I did it superbly. I was really surprised myself. At the end of the surgery, I looked around and I saw some rubble in the corner of the operating theater. I said, what happened? They said, while you were operating, the roof caved in over there and you didn't notice. It's that kind of attention. It's unbreakable. It's also a state where your skills are called upon at the utmost and whatever the demand is, you can meet it. You're very flexible, very adaptable. And very tellingly, it's a state that feels good. It's, it's like rapport. Rapport is mutual flow, interpersonal flow. So that's when focus is 100%. When you have too much to do, too little time, too little support, when you feel overwhelmed, you're down here. And the stress hormones are at their highest. You're in a state which was called recently in a scientific journal, actually the journal Science, uh, in an article was called The Neurobiology of Frazzle. I don't know if you're familiar with Frazzle. I've been there many times. It's constant stress. <clears throat> and here the problem is you can't stop thinking about what's upsetting you, what's stressing you. You're not focusing here. You're not focusing on the task at hand. You're focusing on what's upsetting you, and that's the power of emotions. Emotions take over attention. They guide attention, and if they're too strong, then you'll uh, never get up here. Over here, performance is low because people are under-motivated, disengaged. This is a huge problem, disengagement in the workplace. People feel, uh, in fact, there was a survey. This is really interesting. It was done at Harvard. 2,500 people are given an iPhone app, and the app rings them at uh, random times during the day, and they answer two questions. What are you doing now? And what are you thinking about now? And the discrepancy, of course, is a, is a measure of mind wandering. Turns out 50% of the time, on average, our minds are wandering. The one activity that had the highest focus, no surprise, was making love. But who fills out that app at a time like that? <laughs> I still haven't been able to figure that out. The, the lowest three were commuting, sitting at a computer, and work. 
That's this. So if you're not engaged uh, in what you're doing, your cortisol levels are too low. So I've been talking about focusing as though it were the only valuable kind of attention. But actually, mind wandering, which is the enemy of focusing, the term they use in, in brain science is they are anti-correlated. If your mind is wandering, by definition, you're not focusing and vice versa. Mind wandering is absolutely essential for creative insight. The creative process demands that first of all you gather information, you focus on the problem, you really concentrate, and then you let go. The annals of science are, and mathematics are full of people who came up with incredible solutions when they're just daydreaming, in the shower, getting on a bus, walking your dog. And that's because during mind wandering, we're able to make connections between remote elements in a new way that has value. That's the definition of a creative act. Of course, if you're going to execute, if you're going to put the idea to use, then you have to go back into focus. But mind wandering is extremely, uh, extremely valuable. There's another level at which attention operates. This has to do with leadership. I, I argue that leaders need three kinds of focus to be really effective. The first is an inner focus. Let me tell you about a, a case that's actually from the annals of neurology. There was a, a corporate lawyer who unfortunately had a small prefrontal brain tumor. It was discovered early, operated on successfully. After the surgery though, he was, it was a very puzzling picture because he was absolutely as smart as he had been before, very high IQ, no problem with attention or memory, but he couldn't do his job anymore. He couldn't do any job. He, in fact, uh, he ended up out of work. His wife left him. He lost his home. He's living in his brother's spare bedroom. And in despair, he went to see a, a famous neurologist named Antonio Damasio. Damasio specializes in the circuitry between the prefrontal area, which is where we consciously pay attention to what matters now, where we make decisions, where we learn, and the emotional centers in the midbrain, particularly the amygdala, which is our radar for, radar for danger. It, it triggers our strong emotions. They had cut the connection between the prefrontal area and the emotional centers. And Damasio at first was puzzled. He, he realized that this fellow on every uh, neurological test was perfectly fine, but he, something was wrong. And then he got a clue. He asked the lawyer, when should we have our next appointment? And he realized the lawyer could give him the rational pros and cons of every hour for the next two weeks, but he didn't know which is best. And Damasio says, when we're making a decision, any decision, when to have the next appointment, should I leave my job for another one, what strategy should we follow going into the future, Who sh should I marry this fellow compared to all the other fellows I marry? Those are decisions that require we draw on our entire life experience. And the circuitry that collects that life experience is very base brain. It's very ancient in the brain. And it has no direct connection to the part of the brain that thinks in words. It has very rich connectivity to the gastrointestinal tract, to the gut. So we get a gut feeling. Feels right, doesn't feel right. Damasio calls them somatic markers. It's a language of the body. And the ability to tune into this is extremely important because this is valuable data too. Uh, they did a study of California entrepreneurs and asked them, how do you make your decisions? These are people who built a business from nothing to hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. And they more or less said the same strategy. I'm a voracious gatherer of information. I want to see the numbers, but if it doesn't feel right, I won't go ahead with the deal. They're tuning into their gut feelings. I know someone, uh, I grew up in a, the farm region of California, the Central Valley, and my high school had a rival high school in the next town, and I met a, someone who went to that other high school. He, he almost, he was not a good student. He almost failed, he didn't graduate, came close to not graduating high school. He went to a two-year college, a community college as we call them, found his way into film, which he loved, and 
got into a film school. In film school, his student project caught the eye of a director who asked him to become an assistant. And he did so well at that that the director arranged for him to direct his own film, someone else's script. He did so well at that, they let him uh, direct a script that he had written. And that film did surprisingly well. So the studio that financed that film said, uh, if you want to do another one, we will back you. And he, however, hated the way the studio edited the film. He felt he was a creative artist and they had butchered his art. He said, I'm gonna do the film on my own. I'm gonna finance it myself. This was, everyone in the film business that he knew said, this is a huge mistake. You shouldn't do this. But he went ahead and he ran out of money. Uh, to, it had to go to 11 banks before he could get a loan. He finished, managed to finish the film. You may have seen the film, it's called Star Wars. <laughs> so George Lucas made a decision on the basis of his gut. It didn't feel right to let the studio mangle his next film. He, it was his integrity. And this inner sense is ethical, it's an ethical rudder. You know, it, it answers the question, is what I'm about to do in keeping with my sense of meaning, values, purpose, and ethics? That's not a question that we answer first in words. We answer it first in what feels right and doesn't feel right. Then we put it into words. And every leader today needs a strong ethical rudder. So I'd say an inner uh, awareness, inner focus is essential. Then there's other focus, which is being able to read people, being able to tune in to the, a person. There are three kinds of empathy, and this is empathy I'm talking about. The first is cognitive. Cognitive empathy means I understand how you think about things, your mental models, how you see the world. What that means is I'm able to communicate with you in terms you really understand, you really resonate with. Managers, leaders who are able to talk uh, to other people with good cognitive empathy are able to get better than expected performance out of people because they know how to mobilize them, they know what matters. Then there's emotional empathy. Emotional empathy is an immediate felt sense of what's going on in the other person. And this is absolutely essential too. If you only have cognitive empathy and you don't have emotional empathy, you'll, be, you'll miss the mark. The third kind of empathy is very important too. It's empathic concern. Not only do I know how you think and how you feel, but if there's something, I, something you need and I can help you with, I'm predisposed to help. The leaders who have the most loyalty, who people love working for, have all three kinds of empathy. There's an article um, in the Harvard Business Review called Leadership Run Amok. Leadership Run Amok is about people who may have cognitive empathy but lack the other two. These are leaders who are very good at hitting the target, for example, but don't care about what happens to the people that they manage. They have no feeling for them and so they demoralize uh, people or people are ready to leave uh, if, if they're able. The third kind of focus is outer focus. This is very important, for example, in formulating strategy. You need to understand the ecosystem within which your organization operates. You need to be able to sense what's going to work, what we'll need to do in the future, and so on. And for that, you need a kind of systems view, big picture thinking. Um, the, Sad story here is actually the Blackberry. There are two kinds of, basically, two kinds of strategic thinking. One is exploitation, the other is exploration. In exploitation, you take a product or a brand that's worked very, very well, and you fine tune it, you tweak it, you keep making it uh, better because it keeps working for you. That's what Blackberry did. The danger is if you don't also explore. Exploration means you, see, you look widely, you see what's happening, where things are going. You do R&D, you try to come up with the next new thing. And they failed, uh, they failed to see, for example, Samsung. They failed to see what the competition was doing. If you, so if you don't have an inner focus and an other focus and an outer focus, the danger is being rudderless, clueless, 
or blindsided. Attention is a mental muscle. It's, it's like going to the gym. If you go to the gym and you lift weights, every time you do a repetition, you strengthen the muscle that you're working. Attention can be strengthened in the same way. Uh, in fact, I think I'll show you how, if you're interested. It just take two minutes. All you have to do is sit straight up. Close your eyes and bring your attention to your breath. Don't try to control your breath. Just watch your breath. Observe it. Try to sense it coming in and out, maybe your nostrils. And watch every breath, the full in-breath, the full out-breath. Start over again with the next breath. And just start again with the next breath. Be fully aware of the sensation. And if you find that your mind is somewhere else, bring it back again and gently restart. Now you can open your eyes. Did anybody notice their mind wandering? Did anybody bring it back? That's the rep. Actually, the exercise is not keeping your mind focused. The exercise is when it wanders, bringing it back. That's what strengthens the connectivity in the attentional circuitry. This is a study that was done at um, Emory University and this is a basic muscle of mind. What's interesting to me is that we don't exercise it, typically. We depend on externals to grab our attention. In fact, our economy, in a sense, is built on the grabbing of attention. Habituation is what the brain does when it sees the same old thing day after day after day, same, walking the same way to work or whatever it is. You don't see it after a while. The brain economizes on attention. Orienting, on the other hand, is opening up. It's whenever the brain encounters something new, novel, and surprising. It excites the brain. And think about it. Every season, there's a new fashion. Well, what is a new fashion? It's actually a minor variation on a basic product. Every year, there's a new car. Well, what's a new car? It's just enough difference to excite the orienting response. So it's the basis of our economy. It's a very radical move to cultivate the ability to manage your own mind so that you can orient at will. But that's exactly what's possible with attention training. And I've become a big advocate of it. One of the reason is the research. Richard Davidson, who's a neuroscientist at the University of Wisconsin, has expertise in uh, the brain and emotion. And he's found in his research that when we're agitated, when we're upset and angry and anxious, there's a lot of activity in the right prefrontal area, just behind the forehead. Also in the amygdala, the brain's uh, trigger point for the fight, flight, freeze response. When we're, on the other hand, in a really positive state, I feel great, enthusiastic, what a wonderful day. There's a lot of activity on the left side and no activity on the right. Each of us has a, re a ratio at rest of right to left activity that predicts our mood range day to day. He finds there's a bell curve for this, like for IQ. Most of us are in the middle. We have bad days, we have good days. If you're very far to the right, you may be clinically depressed or clinically anxious. If you're very far to the left, you're very resilient. You bounce right back from setbacks. So Davidson, 
paired up with a fellow named John Kabat-Zinn, who has made mindfulness, as he calls it, uh, very popular, for example, in the, in the medical sector as a way to manage uh, chronic conditions. And also, in the States, at least in business recently, a lot of businesses are bringing it in. And it's more or less what we just did. Davidson and Kabat-Zinn went to a biotech startup, a 24-7, you know, high-pressure environment, and they taught people how to do mindfulness, which is more or less uh, the exercise of watching the breath. But they did it 30 minutes a day for eight weeks. What he found was that before that, people's brains were tilted to the right. They're pretty hassled and stressed. After eight weeks, 30 minutes a day, they were tilting back toward the left. And what's very interesting is people spontaneously started saying, hey, you know, I'm starting to enjoy my work again. I remember what I love about this job. What it means. In other words, the positive mood was really making a difference. There's one reason that uh, businesses are bringing it in. I myself feel that it's not we adults who are most in need of paying attention to attention in this way. I think it's children. Because childhood has changed. Childhood has changed as a side effect of this onslaught of the digital world into our personal universe. Uh, I was talking to an eighth grade teacher who was complaining about how kids now are texting in the States. I don't know about here. Texting has overcome phone calls among teenagers as a preferred way to connect. They're kids who will send 100 texts a day to their friends. And that's, that's not unusual. She said, you know, for 20 years I've been teaching the same book to my 13-year-olds. It's Edith Hamilton's Mythology. And she said, in the last two, three, four years, my students are starting to say they're having trouble reading this. It's a little too hard. And she attributes it to a loss of uh, ability to comprehend because of this constant distraction. I saw a kid, maybe nine or 10 years old, riding a bicycle and texting while he was riding. Can you believe that? Luckily, it was in the country, on a country lane. The reason I'm worried about children is that the brain is the last organ of the body to become anatomically mature. It starts growing from birth and it actually doesn't finish until the mid-twenties. During that time, the principle of neuroplasticity is extremely important. Neuroplasticity says that repeated experiences shape the brain. Use it or lose it is another way of saying it. If a child has an experience, for example, of empathy and another experience of empathy, the circuitry for empathy grows. If a child has the experience of paying full attention and ignoring distractors, which is what we just did, the connectivity for that circuitry grows. And children need this in order for their brains to develop well. When we see a child grow and go through different phases of childhood, what we're seeing are the external signs of brain growth. And I think it's, it's incumbent on us to help children shape their brains in the best way. I was in a classroom of seven-year-olds in Spanish Harlem in Manhattan. Spanish Harlem is a very impoverished place. The, the children there live in, in housing projects, uh, and the projects are pretty dire. One child came to class, the teacher told me, and was a little shaken. Uh, he'd just seen somebody shot. And the teacher said, how many, how many of you have seen, know someone who's been shot? Every hand went up. It's that kind of childhood. It's a very tough place. And I happened to be there uh, to watch something called Breathing Buddies. Every day, this classroom, all the kids have a session where they go to their little cubbies and they get a favorite stuffed animal and they lie down on a rug on the floor. They put the animal on their belly and they watch it go up with the in-breath and down when they breathe out. And they count one, two, three on the in-breath, one, two, three on the out-breath. And they're doing exactly what we just did. Exactly what, they're strengthening the capacity, the mental muscle of attention. There's something else, there's a twofer here because the same 
circuitry also calms stormy emotions. The ability to manage emotions is inextricably linked with the ability to pay attention. And the teacher said, you know, one day because of a scheduling problem, we had to skip this and the class was chaotic. The class was chaotic. So it makes a huge difference for these kids. I've long been an advocate of what's called social emotional learning. Social emotional learning takes the emotional intelligence components, self-awareness, managing your inner life, empathy, handling relationships, and makes it part of the curriculum. Not in a way that takes away from academics, but in a way that enhances children's ability to handle themselves and their relationships. And children's relationships, if you're a parent, I don't need to tell you this, but from puberty on, before puberty, the most important relationships in a child's life are family. After puberty, forget family, it's other kids. And the melodramas of childhood, they didn't invite me to the party, whatever it may be, capture attention. Those are emotional upsets. The more you can manage those upsets, the more attentional capacity you have to hear what the teacher is saying. One of the things they do in these classes, in these programs, I've seen this in New Haven in a neighborhood very similar to Spanish Harlem. There's a, a poster on the wall of every classroom. It's a stoplight, a traffic light, red light, yellow light, green light. It says, when you're upset, remember the stoplight. Red light, stop, calm down, and think before you act. Well, stop says you have a choice. Calm down means you can manage your inner turmoil. Think before you act is a very valuable lesson because it says you can't determine what emotions you're gonna have. Our emotions come unbidden. But once you have them, you can stop and think what you're going to do. In fact, one definition of maturity is lengthening the gap between impulse and action. Yellow light, think of a range of things you could do and what the consequences might be. Green light, pick the best one and try it out. This is a lesson in what's called cognitive control. Some of you may know about the marshmallow test. It's a rather legendary study in psychology. Four-year-olds at Stanford University are brought into a room one by one, sat down at a small table, big juicy marshmallow put in front of them. The experimenter says to this four-year-old, you can have the marshmallow now if you want, but if you don't eat it till I come back from running an errand, you can have two then. Then she leaves the room. This is a predicament that tries the soul of any four-year-old, I, I assure you. I've seen video on it. Some of them will go up and sniff it as though it were dangerous and then jump back, and others go off and sing and dance to themselves in a corner to stay distracted. About a third of the kids can't stand it. They just grab it and gobble it down on the spot. And another third or so wait the endless 10, 12 minutes until the experimenter comes back and they get the two marshmallows. The payoff from the study came 14 years later when they're tracked down as they're about to go to university and the two groups are compared, the ones who gobbled, the ones who waited. And it turns out the ones who waited get along much better with their peers, they're still able to delay gratification in pursuit of their goals, which is exactly what that's a test of. And this was a surprise on the American University Entrance Exam, the SAT, which at that time had 1,600 total points. The kids who waited uh, had a 210 point advantage over the kids who grabbed. This is really interesting because these are all children of parents at Stanford University. These are high IQ, high achieving families. So what's going on? The, the difference seems to be that if you're not able to manage your impulse, and mind wandering is kind of a microcosm of that, then you're gonna be more upset, you're gonna be more emotional, you're not gonna be able to pay attention to what the teacher is saying. So you can't learn as well. There was a study done just a few years ago uh, in New Zealand. Every child in a city in New Zealand became part, who was born over a course of a year, became part of the study. From ages four to eight, they were rigorously tested on cognitive control, many different measures, including the marshmallow type test. And then when they're in their 30s, they're tracked down again. 
And it turned out that cognitive control, the ability to keep your mind here or bring it back when it wanders, was a better predictor of financial success and health in the mid-30s than either IQ or the social economic status of the family you grew up in. It's a completely independent factor. In fact, the people who did the study argue that we should be teaching this ability to children in order to level the playing field. So this is becoming part of social emotional learning. Social emotional learning though also means being smart about your relationships. So uh, here's something that happened in New Haven among 11 year old boys. They're going to play what we call soccer. I think you erroneously call it football here, is that right? <laughs> so the, these kids were, or three boys going to play soccer. The, the first kid is kind of pudgy, not very athletic. And the two kids behind are very good at soccer, very athletic, and they're making sarcastic remarks to this first kid. And one of the other kids says to this first kid, the big sneer, oh, so you think you're going to play soccer. And the pudgy kid stops, takes a deep breath as though to brace himself for the confrontation ahead. This could easily lead to a fight in this school turns around and says, yeah, I'm going to try to play soccer. I'm not very good at it. What I'm good at is art. Show me anything. I can draw it really well. But you, you're fantastic at soccer. Someday I'd like to be as good as you are. And at that, the other kid just melts, comes up, puts his arm around and says, oh, you're not so bad. Let me show you a thing or two. <laughs> that was no accident. That is called a put-up. That boy learned it in his SEL. It's a way to handle put-downs, which is a very big problem in the teenage, early teen years. And it's just part of a wider curriculum which pays attention to what matters to kids. And attention needs to be part uh, of that curriculum. And it's not just schools. You know, parents are the first coach in all of this. When you pick up a baby who's crying and soothe her, you're actually teaching her how to soothe herself. When you point out to a toddler, you know, when you did that, it made your friend feel bad. That's a lesson in empathy. So it's, you know, these the lessons in attention, in emotional intelligence, start very, very early in life. But I think we've got to get better at it. One reason is the kids are being exposed more and more to influences that aren't so great. I don't know if you know anyone uh, any youngster who likes video games and spends hours at them, maybe it doesn't happen here in London, but uh, it's a big problem worldwide. And the data on video games is rather mixed. For one thing, they actually do enhance some aspects of attention. If you're a kid who likes to play fighting games, you know, battle games, and you have to be constantly on the lookout for the enemy who might pop up and, and kill you, it's very good for enhancing vigilance. You could be a very good air traffic controller, for example. However, it also means that if a kid happens to bump you in the hallway, your first thought is that he has a grudge against you. You get a, a bias toward hostile attribution. So the video games that we have now are rather mixed, but there's a new generation coming along which is using findings from cognitive science uh, there's one called Tenacity that I had my four grandchildren play, ages 7 to 13 at the time. In Tenacity, you have an iPad. Every time you breathe out, you tap the screen. On the fifth out breath, you tap it twice. If you do that, you get a visual reward, you know, flowers blooming in the desert. As you do it more and more, it gets harder and harder. So basically what it's doing is training attention, but in a way that keeps the attention of kids the same way that all the other video games do. There are, there are other things uh, that we could be using. You know, the media generally, and I say this as a reformed journalist, the media gives us a very toxic view of the world. Most of the news we get is about disaster, threats, horrible things happening to people. It's news for the amygdala. The amygdala is a very primitive part of the brain that wants to know what are the dangers. However, if we were to take on any given day all of the acts of kindness performed around the globe, 
You know, a mom feeding her kid is an act of kindness. And we're to put it on one scale, and then we're to take all the atrocious acts and put them on another scale. The acts of kindness would far outweigh those of meanness. But we don't get that sense of the world looking through a media lens. But you, we can use the media better. One example I like is uh, Sesame Street. If you, have ever, if you have a toddler, have had a toddler, you may have watched Sesame Street. Sesame Street, I found when I visited Sesame Workshop, is actually a very sophisticated operation. The day I went there, the, the script writers were meeting with two cognitive scientists. They're actually meeting about cognitive control because Sesame Street segments turn out to be lessons based in science, wrapped in entertainment. One of the things that, uh, segments that aired this season is the Cookie Connoisseur Club. I don't know if you're familiar with Cookie Monster. Cookie Monster is one of the stars of Sesame Street, and he loves to gobble cookies. But Alan, who runs a store on Sesame Street, decided to start a cookie connoisseur club, very much like a wine connoisseur club. In the cookie connoisseur club, you take a cookie and you study it to see if there are imperfections, then you sniff it for aroma, and then you take a nibble to taste it. Cookie Monster, of course, was dying to get into the club. So Alan gives him a cookie and he instantly gobbles it down. He can't restrain himself. So Alan tells him, you know, in this club, we're going to try all kinds of cookies. So if you don't gobble it down, I can let you into the club, and you're going to be able to eat many, many different kinds of cookies. That does it for cookie. So that's a lesson. This is a show that is loved by two- to four-year-olds. And two- to four-year-olds learn largely by modeling. So what's happening with cookie is that people, that the kids are learning a lesson in cognitive control. And I think the more of that the better. So let me finish with, um, by telling you about a smart use of positive emotion, of being able to manage our own internal world, of that uh, inner focus. There is a remarkable man named Matthew Ricard. He's, he's written some books on happiness. He's, a, He's French. He has a doctorate in cell biology from Pasteur Institute. His mentor there actually won a Nobel Prize for the research they're doing. But after graduate school, he made a startling decision. He decided he'd give up science and go to the Himalayas, become a monk, and meditate for the rest of his life. He's been called, uh, I think by his publisher's publicist, the happiest man in the world because he's been studied by scientists, and on this right-to-left ratio, he's very far to the left. There's a scientist named Paul Ekman, who's the world's expert on the facial expression of emotion. Paul is the keenest observer of the face as a revealer of what you're feeling. He's a very dangerous man. I once was walking down the street with Paul on the way to a meeting that I was conducting, and Paul was telling me about a system for training people to get good at this that he had just developed. And as he was telling it, we're getting to the meeting hall, and I thought, this is really interesting, but I hope he wraps it up. I've got to think about what I'm going to do in the meeting. At that moment, he says to me, and if someone had studied the system, they'd know you're getting a little angry with me right now. <laughs> this is why Paul is so dangerous. Paul was interested in emotional contagion. He wanted to know what would the effect be of uh, someone like Matthew, who was very, very upbeat, on someone who was quite the opposite. So Paul did a quiet phone survey of uh, the faculty at the university where he teaches, asking who is the most uh, abrasive, difficult, confrontational member of our faculty. Oddly enough, everyone agreed who that was. <laughs> so he calls Professor X, he says, in the interest of science, would you uh, take part in a scientific experiment? And the professor's delighted. He said, sure, I'd be happy to. As the day drew nearer and nearer, he started making demands which became increasingly outrageous. And so they had to dump him and go with the second most difficult <laughs> professor. And the uh, experiment was they're both they're having 
uh, Matthew and the professor have their physiology measured, and they're going to have a debate. The debate is on the premise that the professor should do what Matthew did. The professor had a very uh, influential, secure, well-paid, tenured position, but it, the uh, premise of the debate was that he would give it up and uh, become a monk and go to a hermitage for the rest of his life. At the beginning of this debate, the physiology showed he was really agitated at the thought of that. Matthew was totally calm. So as the discussion starts, Matthew stays absolutely calm and the professor gets calmer and calmer and calmer. By the end of 15 minutes, he's having such a good time, he doesn't want to stop the discussion. So our emotions are contagious for better or for worse, particularly when we pay full attention to each other. I once was uh, waiting for a bus on a very hot, humid day in New York City in, in August. It's the kind of day, I don't know about London, but in New York we have a rather invisible balloon around us. We're feeling a little prickly. It says, don't talk to me, don't touch me. And I had my balloon intact and the bus pulls up, get on with my balloon, and the bus driver did something quite surprising, he actually spoke to me. He said, how's your day been? I was shocked, but I sat down, taking most of my bubble with me. And then I realized this bus driver's carrying on a conversation with everyone on the bus. You're looking for suits, are you? You know, there's a great sale over here on the right in this department store. And did you hear about the Monet exhibit on the left at the museum? Wonderful. And the Cineplex on, uh, we're coming to here. I know the Movie in Cinema 4 got the best reviews, but the one in Cinema 2, I saw it the other night, fantastic, you should, on and on like that. And then people would get off the bus and he'd say to them, I hope the rest of your day is really wonderful. That man was an urban saint. He transformed everyone on the bus. He was sending ripples of good feeling through a city that sorely needed it. And I think the bottom line is, you know, you don't have to go to the Himalayas for decades. We all can do that in our lives if we pay attention. Thank you very much. So I'm happy to, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. There are mics here and there's standing mics, I'm told, in the galleries. So just raise your hand if you have a question. First question over here. You mentioned the low cultures in America where there are murders every day. Stephen Pinker writes very well about some of these cultures and explains that people will be killed over a simple slight, a disrespect or something. And it's ingrained in the culture, it's innate. The thing that I can see, there's a, there seems to be an insidious political correctness in the world today where we're not allowed to say that a culture is a rubbish culture. And in doing that, we don't address the problems with these people. So every day they continue to have the low expectations, the murders, the, the social milieu that creates mm. and continues to create what you in America call the broken window syndrome. Mm. And I wondered what your view was on the inability for people to address these problems honestly and openly, and even going on to the fact that a lot of our condition is genetically inherited, the brain is no different to any other organ in the body, that whole groups of people get a particular kind of genetic. Sure. And well, I think it's it a very important that, question. Yeah, that, yeah. that um, it's, it's not being mm -hmm. addressed at all, and we're losing out over that. Yes, well... I, ha I know of some data which speaks directly to that. I think, first of all, we have to be very careful about stereotypes. Because uh, in any given neighborhood, there's a range of variation who happens to live there. There may happen to be some very talented young people who live in a neighborhood which is otherwise rife with problems. So, uh, for one thing, we should allow for individual differences, but generally, uh, it, it's a worldwide problem what to do with children who grow up in dire poverty. Because for one thing, uh, the brain is, is uh, very fragile. So if you're not well nourished in childhood, the brain doesn't grow as well. And worldwide, children who grow up in poverty can have undernourished brains, uh, which makes them susceptible to all kinds of behavioral problems, particularly when it comes to a prefrontal development. As I mentioned, the prefrontal area is the one that manages 
emotions. So if you can't handle your rage, for instance, many people who end up in murderer's row, who've killed someone, have uh, damaged the prefrontal area, it's been found. So we need to face this, as you suggest, starkly and see what the problems are and what the possible interventions might be. Because I would never write off an entire group of children. I would say instead, these are developing brains. Let's help them develop as well as they could. And in fact, I mentioned that the New Zealand study uh, suggested that we have active interventions, particularly in early childhood. There's a famous study done in the, it's called the Perry, P-E-R-R-Y, preschool study, where children, had an children from a neighborhood like this had a very enriched program, and they did much, much better in life than other kids from the same neighborhood. And the question of IQ and class is very important to understand. In cultures worldwide where there's a privileged caste or class and an underprivileged caste or class, there was always a wide gap in IQ scores between the privileged and the underprivileged. And it's taken to be genetic. However, there's something called the Flynn effect. Flynn is a researcher uh, at the University of Otago in New Zealand. And he's shown with vast data sets that every three, four, five years, when IQ tests are revised, they have to make questions harder. They have to make questions harder because kids become smarter every generation than previous generations. In other words, it's not fixed. The other thing he's found is that when, chill, when a group from a, a caste which is, or class which is underprivileged migrates to a country where the bias about that caste or class doesn't exist, their children do as well as other children. So it's not genetic. It's largely situational. So you're absolutely right. We have to look squarely at those situations and see what we can do to help. Where's the mic? Next question. Hello there. Thank you for your talk. Very much enjoyed it. Mm. Um, my question um, relates back to the... Um, the situation of the marshmallows, and you said if you give oh. one child one, yes, uh, four-year-olds have one and one, and if one eats one later, then he'll have two. Mm -hmm. And you said when they got to their thirties, you know, the high achievers were the ones who waited. Right. How much of that is linked to addiction? You mean wanting the two marshmallows right away? You could get addicted to marshmallows, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, but is that, do you... Yes, yeah, exactly. The studies. inability to control impulse uh, makes one susceptible to alcoholism, addiction, shopaholism, gambling addiction, and so on, uh, because you, you want the hit, and you, you don't restrain yourself and, and see that there are other ways to go. Yeah. By the way, don't try that at home with your child, the marshmallow test. I know someone... <laughs> who tried it with his four-year-old daughter, and he, he peeked to see what she did. He put the marshmallow and he left the room. She took the marshmallow, she took out the middle of the marshmallow <laughs> and ate it, and then put it back. <laughs> She's probably CEO of a company now, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I have good news, good news and bad news. <laughs> Uh, the brain uh, becomes anatomically mature in the mid-20s, but it doesn't mean it's too late to change habit. However, habits instantiated in the brain uh, in childhood are very strong. So if you end up, say, addicted or overly anxious or whatever it may be, it's still possible to change, but you need to make an added effort. And the reason is that you have to practice the new, healthy, better behavior over and over because you've practiced the bad way 10,000 times. You know, you've, you've done it over and over and the circuitry is so strong. But here, uh, cross your arms. This is what a habit feels like. Now cross them the other way with the other arm on top. That's what it feels like to change a habit. It's a little weird at first, a little that strange. But if you make the effort and keep making the effort at every naturally occurring opportunity, what happens is the neural connectivity for the new pathway gets stronger and stronger until at some point you pass a developmental landmark, a neural landmark, where you do the new 
habit, you perform the new habit effortlessly without thinking about it. It becomes automatic. And what that means is that the connectivity for the new habit has now become stronger than the old one. It's the brain's, now the brain's default choice. But it takes work, it takes more work. My question is um, about the three focuses that you mentioned, the inner, the other, and the outer. Um, I won I'm wondering whether they exist in isolation or whether they exist in a hierarchy. And if so, is there a method of, of moving through them? Well, I think they each can be improved. I don't think there's a hierarchy because, for example, in research on leaders, we found uh, that some leaders can be uh, very good at any two or one of them and bad at any of the others. In other words, every combination is possible. You can be really emotionally intelligent, manage yourself well, uh, manage other people well, but be absolutely blind to systems and to the larger context in which your organization is operating. Or you can be very good uh, at managing yourself and very bad at reading people. There are actually a lot of, in the workplace, there is a whole class of people who are outstanding individual contributors, often very good at systems uh, and work very hard. Computer programmers, for example, who have zero empathy. I was talking to someone uh, here in Europe uh, who was with a company and he said, we have a, a guy who is absolutely brilliant at systems and we can't put him in front of a client. Because when we do, he just starts talking nonstop. He never stops to you know, meet the client, to find out what's on their mind, to understand the problem from their point of view. So here's someone who's very good at inner, at managing himself, and at systems, but not people. Uh, is, uh, you mean, is attention handled differently within different, or valued differently? Yeah, I think that... Yeah, Absolutely. Time, for sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, culture, uh, culture makes an enormous difference, particularly, for example, in valuing attention, attention training. Most of the attention training methods we use now come from Eastern cultures. Because Eastern cultures, like Bhutan, for example, many people in Bhutan are meditators. Uh, maybe, to some extent, almost all of them, all of the citizens. It's part of the culture. It's part of the background. And uh, so the methodologies they have are quite sophisticated. They've been developed over millennia. And people like Richard Davidson, who I mentioned, who do research in this area, are uh, using expert advisors from those cultures to help him understand what, is, uh, what the potential is for us to train attention. Because in the West, we're rather stunted in our view of how to train attention. So I think when it comes to, to uh, a mental faculty, uh, culture makes an enormous difference. The same thing is true, by the way, of emotions. Every, every culture values and expresses emotions differently. Everyone universally has the same wiring for emotion. Um, our, our emotions are contagious. Yes. Therefore, should we spend more or less time with our angry colleagues? <laughs> should we be the American bus driver or the French monk? Should we save the world or save ourselves? <laughs> well, the French monk is actually good at saving everyone. Uh, that's his mission. But Apart from that, I think that uh, it's important to understand the dynamic of sending and receiving emotions. So there are several factors that determine in any given interaction who sends and who receives. There are studies done, for example, where two strangers come into a lab, they fill out a questionnaire, a mood questionnaire, how do you feel right now? Then they sit facing each other in silence for two minutes. Then they fill out the same questionnaire. Turns out the person in that dyad who's most emotionally expressive transmits his or her emotional state to the other person in two silent minutes. So expressivity is very important. On the other hand, power matters. In any human group, it's natural to pay most attention to and put most importance on what the most powerful person in that group says and does. So emotions tend to spread from uh, the person who has power outward. What this means, for example, and these are experiments done on teams, if the leader of a team is in a very bad mood, people on the team catch the mood and performance goes down. 
If the leader of the team is in a very good mood, a positive mood, people catch that and performance goes up. And this is true for business decisions, for creativity, uh, for physical coordination, like putting up a tent. So that's a, a second factor, is the power relationship. The third factor has to do with Matthew Ricard. And that is, how stable are you? If you are going to go and be with your angry colleague, are you stable enough in a positive state that like him, you can bring, or the bus driver, you can bring him into that state? Or are you going to end up angry yourself? So those are at least three factors that might determine the answer. Fascinated by the um, advocacy of social emotional learning. Yes. And it would appear that uh, there are many Western parents today who have glommed onto the same focus in prescribing Ritalin for many of their kids. Can you take a minute and talk a little bit about, you've described an organic approach to improving focus, and I look mm. forward to reading more yeah. about those. But what are the impacts of the over-prescription of Ritalin? Uh, what are the effectiveness, sure. long-term effects? Right. So uh, Ritalin, which of course is, is given to children who have so-called ADHD, Attentional Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Um, you know, 50 years ago, they used to say, well, he's just a little boy, he'll outgrow it. But now it's a, become a diagnostic category. And there's some kids who have genuine problems paying attention. They're not being helped by digital media as they are today. They would be very helped by these lessons in cognitive control, which are very new and are just now being studied. So there are people like Davidson uh, are studying the ways in which we can use attentional training. Think about it. Why has this culture had as its default buying a drug and giving it to our children for something which is a skill deficit? It's a skill deficit. Attention is a skill. I think the reason is there are drug companies who are making a lot of money selling us those drugs and convincing us that this is the better alternative. This is my personal opinion. When in fact, what we have not done is basic research on the attentional mechanisms involved in ADHD and what kind of training would help children get better at it. And I think within the next five years, we're gonna see a uh, set of um, very direct interventions that are non-pharmaceutical in those conditions. Um, I just wanted to ask um, your opinion as to what extent do you think our emotional reactions are learned or innate? Well, our emotions are innate, I think, and our particular emotional reactions are largely learned. I have to recommend my wife's book here. <laughs> it's called Mind Whispering. Her name's Tara Bennett Goldman. She's a psychotherapist. Uh, because she talks about the way in which emotional patterns of reactivity are learned in childhood and how you can use uh, mindfulness, cognitive therapy, a number of interventions to change the habits that are self-defeating. The name of the book is Mind Whispering and her name is Tara Bennett Goldman. I found it very useful. I actually find her even more useful. <laughs>Uh, actually, there's data on that. If you're a pessimist, can you learn to be an optimist? And there's research done by a fellow named Martin Seligman at University of Pennsylvania uh, who developed a field called positive psychology. Uh, he developed the field because psychology for uh, 80 years only studied pathology. So there was a problem. We, the, we hadn't noticed that there was a positive spectrum of emotion and experience. But at any rate, Seligman took kids who were prone to depression, it turned out that they tended to, to be pessimists and to see if they had something that didn't work out or a setback in life, they'd say, it's because of me and I'll always be like that. And he taught them to think differently. Well, it was the circumstance, circumstances can change and I can do something to change them. It's a more optimistic outlook. Uh, and he found that uh, actually after about a year, their, their thinking patterns had changed. But it's what I said, as with any such behavior, we have to keep at it and keep at it at every naturally occurring opportunity and catch ourselves when we go back to the, you know, the old pattern. So, uh, so yes, optimism can be learned. I actually know the, 
the gentleman who invented cognitive therapy. Cognitive therapy looks at our thinking, distorted thinking patterns and helps us see more realistically and it's very effective for depression. Uh, his name is Aaron Beck, he's 93 now. He had a terrible accident that put him in a wheelchair uh, and uh, happened to speak to him after that and he was very upbeat. He's one of the most optimistic people I know. Then he lost sight in one eye, and I was talking to him, he said, well, you know, my right eye works perfectly fine. I can still read And then he went blind in his right eye, and he said, you know, I can still listen to books on tape. In other words, he had the capacity to see what was right instead of what's wrong, which is what you're talking about. Yes. Hi, um, I just had a question about the performance graph that you have there. Yes. Um, you mentioned two extremes. You have the unmotivated yes. low performance end, and then you have the frazzle end. Yes. What can you do if, if you're one of those types of people? What can how we do? Can you, how can you improve your performance? What we can do with this type of person and with this type of person. Yeah. Well, let me ask you in this hypothetical question, are we this type of person or are we managing this type of person? Or a friend of this Who are we? Are we the person? A friend of this type of person. We're a like friend of this type of person. Okay. Let's I have a friend the, who... Yeah. Let's say the undermotivated, disengaged all the time. person. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, what the person needs who is under aroused, who's disengaged, is involvement. To get more motivated, more passionate, more engaged. And there's a, some, there's a literature now on something called good work. Good work combines three things. It combines what we're really good at, our excellence, with what we're really passionate about, what engages us, and what we value with our ethics. If you align those three things, you're naturally gonna go up from here to there. In fact, you'll, you'll get into flow much more easily. So one question to ask our friend is, what would be good work for you, and what could you do to make it a larger proportion of the time in your day or your week or your month, or over the course of the next five years of your career? So, so that's a kind of individual strategy for that. If you're here, if you're frazzle, in frazzle, what you need is calm, so, uh, which is very related to cognitive control, but there are many ways to calm down. However, if you can't, well, there, there are two strategies. If you're, say, frazzle because you have a boss that asks you to do too much in too little time and give too little support, you might get your boss's CV and send it out to a headhunter. But that's not an immediate solution. So instead, you might manage your own world better by finding something that works for you that gets you physiologically relaxed. Uh, it might be meditation, it might be yoga, it might be deep muscle, it might be working out at the gym. Everyone is different. Do it every day. And uh, do it before you go to work or whatever is frazzling you. Because what happens is that over time, your body's set point for uh, stress changes and you'll be able to manage better or to be in a more relaxed state in, in the circumstance. Two general strategies. Yes? Uh, I've got two quick questions. The first one might be a silly question, so I apologize if I've missed this, but do, do you see focus as an extension of emotional intelligence or is it cognitive or is it, is it both? Right. So uh, what I think uh, is that attention was embedded within emotional intelligence because the brain's circuits for emotions, for empathy, and for attention intermingle. Mm. I just never thought about it. I didn't realize I had to write a whole new book about it until right. I did it. Okay. <laughs> the, the second question is, I've got a two-year-old son. Oh. When he's four, I fully intend to do the marshmallow experiment. <laughs> I'm just wondering, between now and then, are there things that I could be doing for him <laughs> that will help him more, be more likely to wait? Um, you're probably doing them already. <laughs> just being a good enough parent is, is, is terrific, yeah. But pay attention to you know, your, your child's feelings, needs. That's very important. 
I wasn't entirely surprised to hear this from a friend um, a little while ago who works in a psychiatric resident hospital. And the difference between the emotions of the sexes is absolutely enormous. Um, if a woman comes in for a session, um, the psychotherapist will say, how's it going? How are you? And out will come exactly how it's going, how they feel. When a man comes in, very little is said. So the psychotherapist will say, on the sofa over there are a collection of soft toys. Pick one up. <laughs> so the man will go and pick up the panda, uh -huh. and the psychotherapist will say, well, how is Mr. Panda today? <laughs> and then it will come. <laughs> so the difference of emotions between the sexes, however we like to think we are basically all the same, I think we are hugely different. So do I. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I just wanted to make a response to the gentleman with the two-year-old, because oh, I have three children, and I'm sure that of all three coming out of exactly the same um, um, environment, probably would react very differently to the marshmallow test. So that goes back to my question, is it learned or innate? And I think often that some people just have a natural emotional intelligence. Oh, yes. I, I didn't answer your question. Uh, the answer is it's both learned and innate, in that each of us is born with a... Uh, a particular range of set points in the uh, brain chemicals that manage emotion. That's our temperament. And as you know, if you have more than one child, kids differ from day one. On the other hand, uh, epigenetics tells us that it's not the genes you have, it's which genes turn on and off that will make the lasting difference. And the behavior in a child is very malleable. So if a child is very impulsive, that child can learn cognitive control. If a child is too constricted, that child could learn to loosen up. There's data on children, for example, who are what are called behaviorally inhibited. This is work of Jerome Kagan at Harvard. He finds that um, about 15% of children are anxious about new stimuli, new playground, new friend, new food, when they're very young. These are the kids who at school age are identified as shy. Uh, and it had been thought that this was just genetic. But what they, he realized when he followed a group of these kids was that some of them by school age weren't shy. And he looked at the parenting they got and he, noted, he found that the difference was this. If your parents identify you as she's shy, and protect you, those are the children who don't change. If parents say to a child, well, you may feel a little timid about it, but go ahead and try it anyway, that child learns, I'll feel a little scared at first, but if I go ahead, I'm gonna have a good time. And those are the children who don't end up shy. So it's, it's a, a, a malleable mix of both. Yeah. And I think we've reached the end of our time. Yeah. Daniel, I think you've... Um held our attention brilliantly. Please will you join me in thanking him for a really fascinating, stimulating talk. Thank you so much.